Good evening and welcome to the Monday, July 8th uh, Administrative Public Works Committee. Uh, we have a quorum. Is there a motion to approve the uh, meeting minutes from June 24th, 2019? Move approval. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries. Uh, we have one speaker signed up for public comment. Good evening, Sue. Hi, I'm Sue Calder, and I just wanted to thank the city and the water department. A couple, some time ago, I got a email that said that water was running in my house for the last four days, and uh, it was nice to get that alert. They suggest I check my toilets and then the outside faucets and one other item. But by the time I got to the basement, I found the leaking toilet. And so it saved me a lot of money. Yeah. And I appreciate that. Yeah. Don't let it happen twice. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> we pay bills and fines too. Are there any other residents signed up to speak? Uh, seeing none, we have one order special, of, excuse me, one special order of business, SP1 parking updates. Erica. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Erica Storley, the Assistant City Manager. Uh, we have a host of parking items on the agenda tonight, and as you recall, we had uh, an update previously on April 29th, and so I'm here to give a short presentation on what we've done since then uh, to help with parking in Evanston. So we, the City Council approved uh, longer parking limits in certain areas around town. So now certain areas you can park for four hours after 5 p.m., certain hours all day you can park for four hours. We made all these changes effective June 1. We've done additional signage. We've done some maps and some posters. We're still working on one for Central Street and downtown. Um, but we did complete this one for Main Dempster that shows where you can go to park uh, for long-term 12 hours, where you can go to park four hours, and where you can go for re your standard two hours. So this offers everybody some flexibility options for longer term classes, things like that. It's really gone over well. We'll continue to evaluate it as we move forward and see if there's additional tweaks that need to be made. But so far, so good. People are really happy. Um, we also put these stickers on the pay boxes and we're doing some additional signage at the request of the council. We've also eliminated the lockout period. That was uh, something that people found challenging where you couldn't immediately extend your time at a meter until a certain amount of time passed. Uh, so people have been utilizing that function and are very appreciative that it's now a little bit easier. Uh, we're trying to extend even further how soon you can do that. I think right now you have to wait until uh, your parking is about to expire before it allows you to do that, but some people have expressed interest in allowing that to have a longer window of time uh, so they don't have to wait until it windows right down to the end before they extend. Uh, so we're working with the vendor on that option. But the most exciting thing that I'm here to talk about tonight is no app fees on Park Evanston app for wallet users. So I've been working diligently with the vendor for the past couple of months to try to eliminate the convenience fee that's added when you use the Park Evanston app. So after months of negotiation with them, we finally settled on what's in your packet for approval tonight, which is a payment model that will split the cost of the convenience fee uh, partially between, <coughs> excuse me, um, people who do not have a wallet and then uh, partially between the city of Evanston paying for the remainder. So originally everybody pays 35 cents per transaction. We've committed or we've gotten that down to 22 cents per transaction. So staff recommendation is that we continue to charge people who do not use a wallet the 35 cents, which is typically visitors and people from out of town, while we waive the fee on all wallet transactions, which are typically residents. So there would be no fees if you paid for your parking through the app if you had the wallet. Right. Erica, before you move on, can you explain what that 35 cent fee covers? Sure. So the, the app is provided to us by the vendor for free at present. So anytime uh, a transaction is made, that 35 cents is charged, that's provided to the vendor to pay for updates to the app, processing credit cards, all of the development that goes into keeping the app updated um, and keeping it secure. So there is some work that's involved in that and the, the vendor has done all that upfront work to develop the app and to make it so that it's available 24 seven and doesn't go down all the time and we can rely on it to use it as a payment method. So it's reasonable that there should be a charge 
<coughs> excuse me, for the app, and we find that this new model is a more reasonable charge uh, than what we were being charged in the past. So it's it's a win. Uh, we also, as part of this negotiation, were able to eliminate the convenience fee that's charged for anybody that pays a citation online. Uh, this is a bone of contention of mine. I feel like online payments in 2019 are just a, the way you, business is done. You rarely get charged if you pay your credit card bill online or anything else, so why should you get charged for paying your citation online? This is just how we do business. We don't charge you if you walk in the door. We shouldn't charge you if you do it online. So as of uh, July 15th, when you go to pay your citation online, you will not be charged this dollar fee. If you do recall, before we had this new vendor, the charge was $2.95, and that was that way for almost 10 years. So we went from two ninety five to a dollar to nothing. So we're incrementally going in the right direction. Did you? Oh, yeah, keep okay. going. Okay. Sorry, Eric, can I just ask a quick question? Um, is there a different vendor that we can use? Or is it, I mean, it, it sounds like they're not the best vendor, but are they the only one we can deal with? Do we have a contractual obligation to stick with them? So they, um, there are certainly other vendors in this, in this field or in this space. Uh, we could use multiple vendors. That is something that uh, some communities are looking at right now, and we are as well. Because why should we tell the community which app they have to use? Maybe there's multiple apps. They can just choose whichever one they want to use and pay. So that's what we're working on also in conjunction with this. So okay. one app doesn't have precedence over another. But that's something that will take some time because... This particular vendor has provided us with signage, created all the zones, basically done everything for us. So they have incentive to keep us. Okay. And so far, they perform fairly well. And there's no option of just paying them a lump sum up front and not having these convenience charges or any of the, the, the I mean, the convenience charges are, it's bogus. <laughs> Bottom line, like even calling it convenience, who's it convenient for? Park for the app developer i mean I, like I, I know you're negotiating as best you can but did they understand that like how bad the situation is to, for residents so the do vendor is is very open to any model of payment that the city wishes to move forward with okay so we could chart we could fund this entirely with city funds or we could do a split model which is what we're suggesting or we could do the model that used to be in place where whoever used it paid for it in, in, in its entirety. Okay. And maybe that made sense five years ago when the app was first introduced that everybody would pay a convenience charge and it would pay for the app development because at the time people hadn't adopted the app and it wasn't the way we do business. Now it's the way we do business. So tonight before you is this agreement with the vendor and if we want to change the model, we certainly can. The price is set doesn't matter how we pay it, the price is set. Okay. It's 22 cents a transaction. So if the city wishes to proceed with us funding the entirety of that, we think that cost is about likely to be $220,000 this year, closer to $300,000 next year based on how usage adoption is going. So that's certainly a direction that the council could decide. Oh, no. At this point, we're just recommending we try this method. Of no, no fee for wallet users, fee for people who pay as you go. But like I said, that's open to council direction. So, all right. And like, so, but I mean, we could, when you say open to council direction, like on what type of timetable? This would be part of next year's budget. We could look at this in September and say this isn't working again. What's our obligation? Uh, so, it could be at any point in time. Okay. It could be tonight. It could be next year's budget, whenever. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Rainey. So pay as you go is money in the meter, or credit card in the meter, not anything not using the app. No, when I refer to pay as you go, it's pay as you go using the app without a wallet. So if you didn't preload money into a wallet that you just keep deducting from, similar to an iPass, that's considered pay as you go on the app. So if you've loaded, oh, this one, if you've loaded your um, license plate in there, and and you pay and you pay every time you that's pay as you go correct and you're still going to pay the 35 the 22 cents so what we're suggesting tonight is that for people who do not preload a wallet which is very similar to the ipass you put 20 dollars in there and it just keeps deducting from the 20 dollars you wouldn't pay anything until it goes down to zero and then you load 20, 20 dollars 20 dollars is the key to not paying the, the but charge. if you don't want to go that route, route then 
you can pay the 35 cents. Right. So that would help offset paying for it for those who adopt the wallet. I don't like that. The other day, I, I was doing city business. I parked four times, four times. For, and I was, I absolutely was not going to pay. I usually pay full time, even though I know I'm going to stay half an hour. I, I paid that 35 cents four times in, in less than two hours. Four times I parked. Right. And the reason that we're recommending that they, we don't do this for wallet users, don't charge the fee, is that when you preload the $20, the city only pays a credit card transaction fee to the credit card provider on one transaction. So you load $20, we get charged a fee on $20, separate and apart from the fee the vendor's charging us. Whereas um, if you every time you swipe the meter, we're paying a transaction fee on every swipe. So that's where the, the fee structure comes into play. But later on, Mike's going to talk about the second most exciting thing that we're going to talk about tonight, <laughs> which is be more time portability. This. this is a very cool thing that's going to happen this fall where you pay your app once, you can move throughout the city. From zone to that's zone. What I, I that's was gonna, what I'm waiting I, for. I that's going to be exciting. Yeah. Yes, I'm waiting for that. Um, keep going. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to introduce Mike Rivera now. He's our interim parking manager. He's going to talk about the rest of the things on the agenda tonight. And Eric, I just before you step down, and I hope that you know this has been a huge issue, and we didn't get here by mistake. It was during our budget season. Members of council, remember, we were trying to plug a two hundred thousand dollar gap and I don't think anybody could have predicted you know the, the impact to the residents so I just want to say thank you very much for all your hard work to get us back to where we started and my follow-up question is how is this going to be communicated citywide or have you already started I just haven't so. uh, pending approval tonight right. um, and the, with the method and direction that we've laid out or whatever direction the direction is we're going to start with heavy promotion um, once we get the contract signed in advance of that July 15th date so that everybody's aware of uh, what we've done and how we're moving forward. So yeah. lots of press releases, social media, et cetera. I haven't seen the math, but I would be curious just to add a little bit extra. And this is just from the hip. If we could do look at doing some type of amnesty or late fees on some of the, the tickets, um, we can talk about that for our next meeting. But I would be curious if when we roll this out, if we could do an amnesty period as well. Okay, we can All look right. into that with our vendor. Thank you very much. Alderman Fleming? Yeah, I just have a quick question about the, the app itself. So if you don't speak English, can the, and I, again, I've not tried this because I speak English, but can the app be, is the app translated to a different language? I'm pretty certain it translates to Spanish, but I will double check that for you and get the answer by the end of the meeting. I'll look right. All right, great, thank you. Good evening, Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, some of the things that we've been working on is, uh, as, as presented in your packet, is increasing the time from 24 hours to 48 hours for booted vehicles. Um, this gives people an extra day to, to pay their fees. Uh, otherwise, before we do a tow, otherwise they would have to incur the fee of over $200 for a tow and a day of storage in the towing yard. Uh, another thing that we have on the packet is updating our code. Um, currently, we accept payment at our parking meters, our pay stations, and our mobile apps via coin, credit card, and uh, mobile apps, so the code is going to be updated with that. Uh, additionally, we have loading zones on 600 Davis, uh, a parking parley program on Lincoln Street, and 12-hour uh, parking on 1400 Sherman, along with two hours on 800 Greenwood. Another thing we're really excited about right now is our multi-garage pass. So for $175 a month, someone will be able to park in any one of our three parking garages. Oh, We've been nice. asked by uh, real estate agents and um, business people that do business in nice. Evanston that want to park in multiple garages for this pass. And this is something that we just launched and it is available now for $175 a month. You can park at the Church Street Garage, the Maple Garage, or the Sherman Avenue parking garage. Okay. Quick question from Alden Sufferton. Sure, th sure, thank you. Uh, that's in and out all day. That's in and out all day. Anyone, you, you can have multiple vehicles on your account, but okay. you can you can check in one vehicle in per session. So okay. you can check in any vehicle, any of the vehicles that you have on your account, per any one session at any of those three parking garages. Okay, so like a family with two cars could split that. No, as long as a a, a, you can have multiple cars in the account, but a family who has two cars can only utilize 
the parking pass for one vehicle in any of the garages. At, oh, wait. Uh, so let's say you have two cars. Sure. We can have one parked at any time, or you can only use it for one car? You can only use it for one car. The uh, pass is for one car in any three of the garages Okay. 24-7. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And before you go for it, Alden Fleming, to respond to your question, yes, it you can select under the option Spanish. Great question. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Next, uh, we're excited about uh, working with uh, zone sharing and time portability. So what this is going to mean is we've been asked about, like Alderman Rainey was alluding, that she paid four times on her app. So what this is going to empower us to do is for people that pay for like zones, like our, our most popular zone in town is $1.50 per hour. So if you pay a dollar in a zone at the dollar fifty per hour, we're going to be allowing you to move anywhere within the city that has the dollar fifty per hour zone. Once you've paid for you know two hours or four hours, whatever that zone is, that's huge. Thank you. Yeah, Alderman Fleming. Yeah, so I know we talked about this in parking and transportation. I also move around a lot. I don't always know the zone. I just pay the app and keep going. Sure. So will our signs be updated, or how will the sign read? So I know if I just move from zone one and I'm moving to zone four if the parking rate is the same. We will have language in the app, so when you make your payment in the app, there'll be language on there that lets you know that you can move from zone to zone. Right, but how will I, I don't always know what the zones are, so if I pay in whatever zone and then I move, and say I go to pay again because I'm a good citizen, will it tell me, oh, you already have 30 minutes left on this zone? The nice thing about this is that we have the same rate citywide, so the only way place it's different is a commuter lot. So unless you're parking by the Central Street Metro, you can part, pay once and park anywhere. So it will take some communication to get that point across, but that's basically what it means. Anywhere except for a commuter lot is going to be the same rate as what you've already paid. Okay, let me ask you another question then, because I know the lot over by Brothers K, I think, is still super cheap, right? The one on Hinman and Main Street? 800 Hinman, that's correct. Yeah. So if I pay the 150 somewhere else and then I move somewhere where it's still 50 cents or whatever that lot is, I'm not forced to pay again because I've already paid extra, correct? Correct. So okay. Bullet point. Yeah. Same or lesser rate. No. Yeah. So you can pay $1.50 and Perfect. move to a place where it's okay. less, but you can't pay less and move to a place where it's more. Thank you. Correct. Also working on improved signage, as you, as you just asked about improved signage. Um, and uh, the, the signage will have uh, directional arrows alerting people to where the parking garages are, to where the four-hour parking zones are, to the 12-hour parking zones that we have in town. Another item that we are looking to move forward with is highlighting five hours for five dollars. Um, that's just the rates that we have in the garage. You can currently park for five hours for five dollars. People don't realize that. If you parked for five hours for five dollars, you would be saving 250 over parking for five hours on the street in front of the parking garage that has a dollar fifty an hour rate. So we're just highlighting the fact that the garages are affordable and that we have vacancy and availability to accommodate more people. Uh, employee parking residential zones. This is something that we're looking to work with the business community to allow. We're working on establishing what the criteria is going to be, how many passes to allow per business, either per size or, or by how many folks are working in the businesses to allow to park in residential business in residential zones throughout the city to alleviate some long-term parking that they may have. That's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. It's huge. On behalf of all our residents, honestly, good work. All right, seeing no questions. Um, the consent calendar, starting with item uh, A1. I'll just go ahead and start and then we'll, there are a lot of items on the consent, so we'll just take our time and go through it. Um, the first item is payroll June 10th, 2019 through 23rd in the dollar amount of $3,151,176.08. Uh, and then also the bills list uh, for July 9th and the number has been corrected in the packet, but for what you're seeing, the new dollar amount is five million forty-two thousand five hundred and forty-eight cents. Excuse me, five hundred forty-eight dollars and nine cents. Um, were there any questions on the bills list? Mr. Rasa first. Seeing none and no lights. All those in favor of passing item A1, I2, please signify by saying aye. Aye. <coughs> Ayes have it. Alderman Fleming, would you like to get us started with item A4, please? 
Item A4 is the Washington National TIF dissolution. The, yeah. Staff recommends City Council accept and place on file the closeout memo for Washington National TIF District. This is for action. Alderman yeah. Rainey, Alderman, excuse me, Alderman Rainey, A5. I was just going to comment on that, on the Washington National TIF for the general public. Sure. If anybody wants to get some idea of what a productive TIF is or some understanding of before and after or there but for a TIF, they should just read this very short memo and see what can be accomplished with a tax increment financing district. It is unbelievable. And it's very, very well written. And um, the information that you will find there is just amazing. So I really encourage, this will take you 10 minutes to read it. So please, please read it. All right, what number am I assigned here? A5. You are? A5. Mm -hmm. um, this is a sole source purchase of uh, West Filter Plant Backwash. Don't read this one, though, because it'll very much confuse <laughs> you. Sole source purchase of West Filter Plant Backwash Rate Controller from LAI Limited. Staff is recommending that we urge the council to authorize the city manager to execute uh, this purchase of the d -Zunk filter backwash rate controller system from uh, LAI Limited uh, in the amount of $22,781. The purchase will be from the water fund account. I move a recommendation to the council. Again, this, these are all on consent, okay. so we're just going to keep on going through them. There are a lot of items. Uh, A7, autumn but suffered. we need to tell people about them. Yes, we do. Yes, yes we, we do. do. Item A7 is a contract award for HVAC Mechanical Engineering Services with Kimley Horn and Associates at the Police Fire Headquarters, Fire Station 3, and the Levy Senior Center in the amount of $59,560. For action. A8. Staff recommends City Council authorize City Manager to execute a contract for engineering design services for emergency generators at the police fire headquarters and fire stations number one and number two with CCJM Engineers Limited uh, in the amount of $34,100. Funding will be provided from the Capital Improvement Program 2019 General Obligation Bonds, which has a budget of uh, $210,000. Thank you, Alderman Simmons. Item A10 is renewal of item A10 is renewal of the 29 2014 elevator service agreement with uh, Vincent Krupp Elevator Corporation for the Sermon Plaza Garage, and that's in the dollar amount of two hundred and five thousand two hundred dollars. Um, Fleming, A11. Sorry, Bevan. A11 is. 2019-2020 fuel purchase from the Gas Depot Oil Company. Staff recommend council approve the fuel purchases from two, July 6, 2019 through July 5, 2020 in the amount of $750,000 from Gas Depot Oil Company of Morton Grove. Um, the company is the current Northwest Municipal Conference bid winner for all grades and types of fuel that are utilized by city vehicles for this time period. Funding for this purchase will be as follows, $750,000 from the Petroleum Products Business Unit in the Fleet Fund that has a fiscal year 19 budget of $750,000 for action. Thank you, Alderman Fleming. Alderman Rainey. Staff is recommending that we ask the Council for approval for the purchase of one replacement street sweeper vehicle for operations and allocated to the Public Works Agency. Uh, the replacement vehicle will be purchased from Standard Equipment Company in the amount of $226,175.50 through the SourceWell contract. Funding for the vehicles will be from the Sewer Fund in the amount of $226,175.55. Move approval. Thank you, Alderman Flavik. Excuse me. Suffered in the next item. Uh, sure. Uh, item A14 is approval of change order number two for Clearwell 9 treated water storage replacement project construction bid 
18-30 in the amount of $22,973.31. A18. A18, staff recommends that City Council adoption of Resolution 65R19, adopting a Public Safety Employee Benefits Act policy. The proposed policy outlines the procedures to be used by the City to determine employer paid health insurance eligibility for former firefighters, paramedics, or police officers catastrophically injured or killed in the line of duty for action. Thank you. Item A19 is Resolution 67-R-19 authorizing motor fuel tax funds transfer from the general uh, maintenance of streets and staff is recommending city council adopt this resolution which would authorize the city manager to transfer the dollar amount of nine hundred eighty two thousand eight hundred and ninety seven uh, dollars in 2019 to the uh, MFT funds for salt purchase and let me keep going and electricity payment and general maintenance of streets and by city forces. The fund transfer was approved as part of the 2019 budget. Funding will be provided from the motor fuel uh, fund uh, as a transfer to the general fund. Thank you all. A20 is resolution 70-R-19 authorizing the use of emergency contract procedures for the Civic Center boiler system repairs. Staff is recommending we adopt this resolution authorizing the use of emergency contract Procedures for Civic Center Boiler System Repairs. The City Manager will execute a contract for these repairs with Great Lakes Plumbing and Heating in Chicago in the amount of $119,400. Funding is available from Capital Improvement Funds, 2019 General Obligation Bonds from the Line Item for Facilities Contingency. The Line Item has a fiscal year 2019 budget of $300,000 with a remaining balance of $232,810 for action. I'd like to take number 23 off. Okay, consent. number 23. So I'll go to the next one. Will be addressed. Yeah. Uh, item A24. Right. Alden um, Rainey, you want to read that? Councils, uh, we're being asked to, the to parking recommend to the council section, the yeah. adoption of Ordinance 66019, which amends portion of the city code, Chapter 10, Section 5 and 11, to properly reflect all parking payment methods and zones. Um, this is a housekeeping matter. Um, I move introduction. Thank you. Is there any reason why we can't take these for intro and action? Can't do what? Just do it for introduction and action tonight. And that one, I sure don't know why. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, we should be able to. Yeah, I would think we can. I mean, I had a concern because these are all from the March yeah. parking and transportation meeting. I'm not sure why they took so long to get to us in the first place. So got it. I would second that motion. So how about we suspend the rules, take them all, and then send them to council as one? Is everyone with well, the exception? I think, I think when you have action and suspension of the rules, it can't be on the consent one. you got to do the next time. So pull them all off and then, is that I'm just, you? That's my opinion. Um, I'll check real quick, but I believe that is correct. Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, so then we're going to come back to item, whenever you check item A23, it's been pulled off to A24, 25. 25 pull off, please. You want 25 off to discuss anyway? Let me circle that. Uh, passenger loading, 26, is everyone okay with that? Keep on moving. And then uh, 27. And then um, that's for the hearing officers. Oh. Yep. So item 28 is uh, ordinance 70-0-19 uh, amending the portions of the city code regarding the scope of authority for hearing officers. This is for the alternatives to arrest committees recommending the city council adopt this ordinance 70-0-19 amending the portions of the city code again uh, regarding their, their uh, scope of authority. Is there a motion to approve, excuse me, is there a motion to approve approve the consent Move agenda. Move approval. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Seeing no lights, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. We're now on to uh, items of consideration. Alderman uh, Fleming, you want to take 8-3? Sure, 
April 8, 3, 2018, audited comprehensive annual financial report. Staff recommend City Council accept and place on file the audited comprehensive financial report. Okay. Did you want to give a brief presentation? Yeah. Okay. Not the presentation, though. Uh, good evening, Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, we have uh, posted on our website the fiscal 18 audit report. Uh, this is required every year for the cities, and I have Dan Berg uh, from the Sikachin Company, who are the our auditors, and he would briefly go over the uh, overall audit report. And if you have any questions, uh, he would answer that, and or even I would be able to answer that. Dan. Thanks, Tash. Thank you all for having me. Um, I'm here to report that the audit went very, very well this year. We began the process back in November with a planning meeting between. Uh, ourselves, uh, four members of our audit team and staff, uh, including Andy and Hitesh and Melita. Um, and they did a great job getting ready for us. We came in mid-January to do our preliminary field work, at which point we sent you all the, the risk assessment questionnaires and um, kind of gathered, got a lay of the land, uh, what's changing in internal controls, what happened during the year financially so that we knew what to ask for. We came back in mid-April and worked through the beginning of May on site, testing the numbers, and I'm happy to report that the results are before you. A clean opinion, the best opinion we're allowed to go give, we call it unmodified. The common term is, uh, is clean. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to read this document, I would strongly encourage you to start with the transmittal letter written by staff. Gives you a little feel for uh, the flavor of the city and then move on to the management discussion and analysis, the part that appears directly after our opinion. And it compares last year to this year and explains to the reader why and what changed. So strongly recommend those two. Additionally, there's a statistical section in the back of the report that is not required by generally accepted accounting principles, but is a requirement of the GFOA, Government Finance Officers Association, for the Certificate of Achievement and for Excellence in Financial Reporting. The city has gotten this uh, um, award for a number of years now, and we believe this report will again receive that award. It requires the city to go above and beyond the normal requirements by gov government standards and by uh, accounting principles to give the reader a lot more information, a lot more flavor of and, and more trends data. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple of uh, items of interest to the city. Uh, investment income with interest rates going up the way they have this past year, investment income was over a million dollars, triple what it was in prior years. So that's excellent news for the city. Um, the other item of note is that the water fund had a net loss for the year of about $615,000. Much of that is due to the ongoing uh, negotiations with the uh, village of Skokie and them paying below the rate that the city is requesting. Um, those are a couple of uh, highlights. I'd be happy to answer any questions about the uh, work product you have before you or the process we went through during the course of the audit. But again, I want to thank city staff for working as hard as they did to keep us uh, on schedule and getting this report out on time. Thank you. Any questions? Um, Fleming? Uh, thank you for your report. My question is more for Hatesh. Um, so Hatesh, I know that by law we have to publish this and it's in the paper and all that. Um, so I guess I have a couple questions. Do you, do you have any idea of who looks at it? I mean, I know I think a copy's here in the clerk's office and people can access it, but we don't do any kind of tracking to see if anyone's actually, okay. But at least we know some of the stakeholders would be like the rating agencies and all that. I mean, right. they, yeah, they kind of look at this thing and yeah, make note of it if any big changes are there. Um, so then my question is, and I don't know if we have time to do it this year, but you know, I, I've read this and it's very lengthy and some of it even is a little difficult for me. Can, is there a way we can make kind of a one page, easy to understand overview of this? And I say that because people obviously during the budget last year, and I'm anticipating the budget this year, people have lots of questions um, about our spending and about bonding and all those kind of things. And I think 
I mean, we just heard from the auditor that we're in pretty good standing, but I don't know that the, the individual citizens are gonna read through this long document. Um, and even though we do publish it and have all the copies here, I don't know that people, even if they came to look at it, could really get a full understanding of it. So I, you know, if we're gonna really work on community engagement, I think it might be good for us to have you know. I mean, um, I mean, it's a very good point, and um, I don't know whether I have already kind of brought up the thing, but because of the time lag, uh, so many communities, not so many, but then you can chime in, uh, do what we call a popular annual financial report. I mean, I did it when I was with the village of Carpentersville for a few years. It's like a six or eight pages, and this is more geared towards the residents. What are the big capital projects that happened this year? Where did the property tax money go, come from? So this is just like you're saying, it's like a six or eight page and more for the residents where they can know the facts in simple. This is where, yeah, this is more sometimes from the accounting standpoint or auditing and gap and all that. Right. So this is definitely, and we are, yeah, I think most likely you would see a, like a six to eight page. PAFR, it's called, just like CAFR, Popular Annual Financial Report. Yeah, well, I would be very um, happy to see you produce something like that for us, particularly as we're finishing this and now we're heading into the budget season and we produce a lot of documents there, but what I find is people are more concerned with what we're cutting and they don't necessarily understand how well we have done even though we are cutting. We would make it a goal and we'll do it next year, yeah. <laughs> Thank and you. you can take it right from this. Oh, yeah. Very simple. Mm -hmm. Right. Seeing no additional lights or questions, all those in favor of passing a, uh, excuse me, sorry, thank you. Place on file item A3, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Thank Opposed? you. Thank you all very much for the one four. Thank, thank you. you. And as always, we work with staff, but for the council, if you ever have any questions of me, please let me know. We appreciate your service. Okay. Item A6, I'm um, ready. Okay, I'm in, in the report right now, A6. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want me to go ahead and? Wait, I, I've got it. I've got it. A six. Uh, sole source purchase of. Um, wait, did you say a six? Yes. Let's see five. Uh, where is it? I'm lost. Let me just go ahead. Somebody and, take it. And sure. I'll, I'll get. Item A6 uh, is for action. It's a contract award with uh, Spring City yeah. okay. Electrical Manufacturing for the Talmadge Street lights, poles, and fixtures. Staff recommends the City Council authorize City Manager to execute the 10 year project with uh, Spring City Electrical Manufacturing. Uh, the cost of the contract through December 31, 2020 will be uh, 177598 uh, the funding comes from the CIP fund. Uh, the detailed summary of the funding include the corresponding transmittal. Uh, this was held over uh, at the June 10th meeting, and it's for, for action, and we have the owner of the company here to speak. Okay, I've never done this before. Sure. So I'm Kelly Gallagher. I'm the owner of Everlights. We're an Evanston business, and we are a supplier of lighting and electrical supplies, a wholesale supplier. So I had um, some questions on this. So it was a supply contract bid, and there was myself, another supply company, and a manufacturer that you submitted prices. So my first question is, my credentials were compared to a manufacturer versus another supplier. It being a supplying contract, I didn't feel that it was appropriate to compare my history with a supplier's history or a manufacturer's history. Um, if you're going to compare two companies that are petitioning to do the bid, it would be, I would, I would suggest either comparing the manufacturer I partnered with, with the manufacturing you're proposing to approve, or me as a supplier with the supplier that they have in their contract documents. My guess that they didn't um, have the supplier in their contract documents bid the contract was because the supplier is less than a year old. Um, so that's my first point. Um, the second point is in their contract, they're asking for a waiver from the uh, Evanston business participation and minority participation, stating that no one had approached them to partner with them on the contract. 
I have an email with me that where we asked them for prices and they told us they were not bidding the job. So we did not, we were unable to negotiate pricing with them to produce a price for the city of Evanston. Um, and then third, I was confused with their pricing structure. They bid the price, the, the manufacturer bid the contract direct. And then during your consulting portion of the contract, they put in what they would, the, the, the supplier will charge. So it skews the numbers a bit. And I am confused if we are actually less or more expensive than the contract that you're trying to award tonight without being able to review the full contract documents. I'm requesting a meeting with the, with the council, with the manufacturer that we're partnered with at Sternberg Lighting, who's been put in throughout the city already. It's at Fountain Square. They're also on Sherman Avenue is Sternberg Lighting. They've been in business for over 100 years. Um, a great company that Evanston has already vetted out. They're also somewhat local, lo located in Roselle, so all manufacturing would be made within the Chicagoland area as well as the distributor would be made local. So that's, that's it. Any questions? Thank you. I, what's that? So they're just, thank you, and I'm gonna ask Director Stoneback. So just to remind everyone, there are two issues with this, I think, is it Carl Klein? who's out in the audience, started the concern over the first company because, and I, I don't know this, I'm just repeating what, summary of what I read was that there was concern that the co initial company went bankrupt. And so I understand the partnership, but as I look a little bit deeper into this and we're gonna be talking about our, our goals and, and what we're trying to achieve both with this and then later uh, item for discussion when we talk about Crown. Um, I think something that we've always maintained on the committee is that, you know, when it comes to Evanston based businesses, it, it, it really doesn't matter if you're an Emma W, it's the fact that you're an Evanston based business. And I've always said that if I had to pick and choose between the requirements or doing business in town, our goal is to do business within town with business that are paying taxes. So I'll, you know, Director Stonebeck, I guess I'm going to ask you to come to explain this because on one hand, we have a local supplier and then we have a, another supplier that's asking to waive. I share your confusion. So I'm just trying to understand what exactly are we trying to do here? Uh, good evening, Dave Stomach, Public Works Director. I, I think there was a two-part question in there. Right. I'll deal with the first one that I heard was in regards to our previous manufacturer, which is, uh, I can't remember their name right now, <laughs> Union Metal. Uh, they did go out of business, and then they were bought out and came back with a very similar name, but it is a different organization. Uh, after, from, within the past two weeks, we reached out to them, made phone calls, they indicate that they uh, are back in business. They have our mold somewhere. They weren't sure where. And then the mold that they do have is a three-piece mold. So that doesn't meet our current requirement to have a one solid piece type of structure uh, to prevent uh, uh, salt water getting in and, and corroding the bases. So we didn't feel that uh, further discussion with Union Metal was necessary. In regards to uh, the concerns raised tonight, uh, our request for a proposal was not limited to who could provide the proposal. So uh, a manufacturer could have, Sternberg could have, and had a, a, a subcontractor, the supplier, part of their contractor, similar to what uh, Spring City did. Uh, there was a concern that the price that Spring City is uh, providing us is, is not the true cost, that there would be a 10% markup on that. We called and we verified that that 10% markup for their supplier is included in the price that they provided for us. Uh, and uh, I guess on an RFP type of process, it, when it's a bid, Evanston businesses are giving, an, uh, if they're within 5% of a low bid, right. then they are Give, awarded the contract or recommended the, the contract. In the RFP process, uh, the an Evanston women or minority firm is one of the 
items that we consider when we're evaluating the firms. So out of a 100-point system, uh, and this is standard throughout all of our requests for proposals, whether the company complies with the full MWEBE compliant, they get five points, or, or if they don't comply at all, they get zero. So uh, Spring City is pr providing some uh, utilization, and that's why they receive five points, where Everlights is receiving five points for this uh, category because they are uh, an Evanston business, and that's shown on the table that's on Even page they were 75 the page, of the, yeah, of they the received document. one versus five. Okay, so uh, again, uh, this is when we write the request for proposals, we tell them the categories that we are going to be rating the responses on. So the experience of qualification, completeness of proposal, the price to cast the mold and supply materials, the willingness to execute our contract and, and MWEB, that's all listed as an item that would be considered when we receive the proposals. Uh, and, and again, the, the city council has the ability to make the recommendation as they want. We, on page 77, provided a cost breakdown of what we believe that this cost will be over the long run. Uh, Spring City has, everybody was asked, requested to provide a cost to uh, make the mold and supply a sample pole. That's in the first column. And then the price per unit for the pole and the luminaries listed. And then some companies indicated that there would be a cost es escalation over time. And so we factored all that in. And then in the last column, we show what the what we believe the cost will be over a 10-year period that the contract is for. Based on, on this, uh, we staff is recommending what we feel is the firm that has the, the best qualifications and is also offering the lowest price. So uh, again, the, the council, not the council, but the city's policy for recommending uh, on bids is if the, an Evanston business is within 5%, but for requests for proposals, MWEB utilization is is considered five points at a total evaluation of the 100 points. And that's the way that mm -hmm. they all have been rated in the past. So if city council wants to change that, uh, that would be part of the discussion I believe that you're looking to have tonight. And and again, this is staff recommendation. The city council has the authority to uh, recommend somebody else or approve the award to a different vendor. So you brought up the discussion that we're going to have later, and I, I, I'll speak from what I don't want to speak for you, but it's, it's clear our ordinance is our ordinance. But I think what's more important is the attention that we give to our local businesses, right? Yes. So I'm not making a suggestion that we change our ordinance from the floor, but we're hearing from someone who's local, and I feel like if we approve this, we're doing two things. We're approving a business that's asking for a waiver, which is number one. And number two, I, I can't remember if it was myself or someone else, I just said in our last meeting, how time sensitive is this? I mean, this is, given the attention of the Robert Crown Project uh, and the work that we're doing on the committee, it's, it's worth our time to get granular. And so I'll use this and we'll have another discussion later on in a few minutes to say, if the vendor comes forward and says there are some things that was a little bit misunderstanding, then I would love for you to staff to meet with the vendor and come back and tell us if we missed something or confirm what you said. But I think Alden Simmons has her lights on. Let's, that's going to be my recommendation. Alden Simmons. Um, thank you. I, I think I'm saying the same thing. I'm not really sure, but I'm asking that we hold this and not approve it tonight. Um, I see that well, I just want to say that um, I heard some things that I would like to get more information on, on yeah. the local business um, not being afforded the opportunity to participate. Um, I understand that, you know, our ordinance is our ordinance, and I don't think that we're asking necessarily to change that, but I, I do think that we are certainly asking um, for 
intentional accommodation and inclusion and invitation for Evanston businesses. So if there is any legal reason why we can't do this, I'm asking that we don't move forward with this right now. So I just wanted to provide, I jumped in, I listened in the background. Um, so I uh, prepared a response to the bid protest. The, the speaker uh, uh, formally protested the bid. Uh, she is um, from Everlights. And um, Spring City is being awarded this. So Spring City is the actual manufacturer. Everlights is basically an intermediary party to the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. So she was submitting a bid on behalf of the manufacturer. So for this RFP, we look at them the same. Manufacturers can submit bids and so can an intermediary, but based on pricing. Did I miss something? I thought she said that they wouldn't allow her she to use them. She participated, no. No, no, not oh. that she participated, but if I heard what she said, Spring, let me pull up. She said that Spring not, City did not allow her to be their intermediary. She was gonna be an intermediary for another company. For two companies that submitted bids, essentially. Well, here no, she comes. I, I well, let her. Well, I don't think we should get. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. But so if you want us to hold this, we can. I just, I, I thought I should add that piece for that. Okay. Sure, it was clear. I, it's not clear. So okay. is it that it was almost like a brokerage? Yes, essentially. Okay. So the price for um, the Spring City includes, if they have a consultant, it includes that fee, and they are the the least expensive. Okay. And then um, the Everlights the local based business includes a consultant fee so we're presenting the one that is the cheapest option so, so the cheap so the one that we are recommending award is direct from the manufacturer correct. versus a it's, it's brokerage a, yes. or a consultant or of sorts. Right. okay correct got it does that add a little bit of clarity that's yeah okay that's that's but i i have another yeah. question just for you um michelle so you said you thank you for submitting a formal whatever i'm the protest, yeah. protest. Um, in, in the future, and I don't know if maybe it just needs to go to the committee, um, is it possible that when, when you get those that you can forward yeah. them on to yeah. council so that you we are that. aware of those things before we start having this free fall sure. discussion? That would Understood. have been helpful. Okay. Yeah. And did you want to respond? I want to kind of clarify a broker. The contract called for a supply contract, and in the electrical and lighting industry, yeah. all supply is is are provided by a wholesale supplier, never direct by the manufacturer, which is why Spring City has a, a supplier listed in their bid. The reason they probably didn't lead with the, with the supplier is because of their history and experience on supplying these kind of contracts, would be my guess. But it always goes through a supply house. Um, it's not a broker, it's my business, and I'm like a Home Depot. Um, you don't go direct to GE to buy something. You go to Home Depot or you go through a supplier to buy it from them, if that helps, yep. that relationship. So me contacting Spring City, I contacted Union Metal. We had great discussions about bringing the Talmadge pull back. Um, it's what we do. We work directly with all manufacturers and provide the best solution to the RFQs as they're presented. So I think there's going to be a motion to hold it. But I think one of two things are going to happen. A, uh, the, the vendor will get clarity in terms of our bid process, which is something that we always fight for. Or you may come back with new information, or you may confirm what's already here. So um, there is a motion to hold. Well, I'll, before, yeah. was there a motion? Was there a second to the motion? She moved to hold, and I'll second. But I just, Could I, ask yeah. Yeah. I didn't see. I'm sorry. Because I'd like another some okay. information. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Alvin Rainey followed by Alvin right. Simmons. So. On which of these, which of these, these are bids, right? These are not proposals. No, are it, it is a proposals? request for proposal. Okay. On which of these proposals, and I don't know the woman's name, which of these proposals is this woman a participant? She is with the uh, Everlights. Right. And what, she is a, a what on, the, on one of these proposals? What did what did she, what role did she play in one of these proposals? She, they submitted a proposal to provide the poles and the fixtures for for per Evanson's request. All right, and her complaint is what? Uh, is I Let's new information came I want, to me I want tonight. us all to hear the same thing. What is her complaint? As I understand it, tonight what I heard for the first time was that she sought to uh, work with Spring City, who manufactures the pole and be their sales rep and submit a proposal to Evanston 
in conjunction with Spring City. Mm. And that she's indicated tonight that she received a email, I believe she said, from Spring City indicating that they were not going to bid on this project and therefore did not work with her on obtaining And the why is that our fault? I, I do not know. Unfortunately, I've worked with Laura on this. I can't, Dave, I mean, Dave doesn't understand or doesn't know all of the details. So, uh, speak into the mic. Everlight's uh, presented a proposal on behalf of uh, Sternberg Lighting. So, she is a broker for Sternberg Lighting, is the actual manufacturer. And just to remind you of your rules, um, this has already been held once, so you cannot hold it a second time. If, if, if you want to keep it in committee, you would have to table it. So, and if I may, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, we were, if we continue to hold this, uh, the impact is is that we we did not buy any Talmadge light fixtures in 2019, uh, and when we go for new manufacturers, the whole process where they make the mold, they supply a pole for demonstration. We approve that, and then they go and make the rest of the poles and in, do in their manufacturing sequence. Right now with Spring City, we're, we won't get the sample pole till sometime in January, February, and then we approve it, and then we're gonna be in jeopardy to receive poles to be installed during our normal summer construction season of 2020. So we have very few poles in stock right now because we bought 15 or so in 2017, 2018 but we didn't buy any in 2019 or 20, and this could jeopardize purchasing polls in 2020. Got it. So the real complaint or concern here is that um, our local business was told that the Spring City wasn't bidding. They bid anyway, and they were the most competitive, and that's who we're recommending we award. And because they're the manufacturer, naturally they're going to be the lowest bidder. And again, Sternberg, who... And that's my understanding based on information I first found out tonight, okay. listening at the same time you did. But Sternberg could have submitted the proposal as well sure. in, instead of Everlight. So I, I'm i just so, I'm kind of confused with the... Yeah, the, got it. The I, mean, but got I, it. I don't know why the argument is with us. That's, and also, do we know that if that if that supplier or whatever her business is was with Spring City, we don't know why they didn't want her with them. I, I, I don't know. Um, but the prices on Spring City are 200000 in the one box and 180000 in the other box lower than Everlight's. Right. I mean, I'm really excited about yeah. that difference. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm sorry, Alderman Rainey. My name is Laura Biggs. I'm the city engineer. Um, and I apologize. Dave was out on vacation during a couple communications that I was involved in. But uh, one of the key things also is the ability to supply poles and different materials. When we went through the Streetlight Master Plan, it was considered really integral to the streetlight uh, the Talmadge light pole that they be um, in like a cast iron material. Now we're upgrading to ductile iron and then in some locations where we need to make faster repairs, aluminum is an easier material, it's much lighter for us to move around with in-house crews or in places where we have corrosion issues, aluminum is a good choice. But in most locations we are actually proposing that we're going to be installing ductile iron poles and Everlights did not offer that as an alternate. They only offered aluminum poles. Um, when we requested information, things like the Design Lights Consortium certification, that allows us, as we change out poles, we get rebates from ComEd, but we only get rebates if the fixture that we're using is a Design Lights Consortium certified fixture. And, uh, the fixture being proposed by Everlights is not Design Lights certified. So there were a number of things that had to do with their um, not being the recommended manufacturer, but the city in general does not get into arguments between contractors and subcontractors or consultants and subconsultants. That's between them. Many vendors 
who are rep just representing manufacturers will only work with one manufacturer for a given product. Anecdotally, another vendor or manufacturer that was um, interested in working on this project and thought that Everlights was going to be repping them and found, and found out when they saw the publication that they weren't being included by. So there's like a whole thing and that is not something that we usually get into the mix between. That's between individual companies. We're only contracting with one person, one entity, and that's who we are legally bound to. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. And so in the interest of time, we still have a few other items. I would request that, and, and thank you all for the information. Again, it started with an email from Carl Klein, concerned about the previous company being bankrupt, and then we received a letter from the current vendor, uh, Director Stoneback Laro, thank you for the clarification. I will still request that, and I said this earlier, Director Stoneback, that someone from your staff meet with the vendor just to go through this. I mean, we had a lot of good dialogue here, but to address any other outstanding questions, I see the benefit of any time we can help a local vendor business become more competitive and understand our process, we should do it. So I appreciate your time in advance. Um, seeing no additional lights, all those in favor of uh, passing item A6, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Seeing no opposed, the motion passes. Item A9, Alderman Simmons. Staff recommends approval of payment to Motorola Solutions of Chicago for the purchase of upgraded mobile communications equipment and the APX emergency scene accountability system. Total cost for this invoice is 1550000 Funding will come from the fire department AFG portal radio grant, which is funded from three sources. A detailed summary of the funding is included in corresponding transmittal memorandum is for action. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Seeing no other further lights, all those in favor of passing item A9, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it. Item A13, Alderman Fleming. 13 is the minute agreement with Passport Parking, incorporated for software license and service agreement for mobile payments for parking platform and a citation management platform. Staff requests that we authorize city manager to execute a three-year amended agreement with Passport Parking for software license and services for, mo for mobile parking payments and for a citation management platform. The contract term is retroactive to January 1st, 2019, continues through December 31st, 2001. Mobile pay transaction fees are reduced from 35 cents to 22 cents per transaction not to exceed $25,000 for 2019, $300,000 for 2020, $350,000 for 2021. Citation management services will be $22,000 a month for a total of $266,400 annually with an additional $1.25 per letter issued after 40 days of non-payment by the citation recipient. Funding is as follows. Citation management fees come from the General Fund Administrative Services Service Agreement and Contracts. Mobile app fees come from the Parking Fund Passport Mobile Parking. And funding for mobile fees will be a mix of parking funds and convenience fees paid for by Park Evanston Pay As You Go users for action. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Alderman Sufferden. in. Sure. So, Eric, are we stuck with this for three years? Similar to other agreements that we sign, we typically have um, an out clause that allows us to provide the vendor with anywhere from 30 to 60 days notice to exit a contract should we decide to do that in the future. Uh, additionally, this contract does not preclude us from adding additional vendors to provide mobile payment services if we were to decide to bring on additional competitors okay. and offer other mobile apps for the service. Do we have to pay to get out or just provide notice? We have to provide notice. Okay. That's a great question. But no, we don't have to pay. Correct. Awesome. Thank you. Alderman um, Fleming. Uh, I have another question. So can you tell me why we would be paying that? I know why, but why we can't issue the um, letter ourselves and save the dollar twenty-five? So the dollar twenty-five covers the printing, the postage, the paper, and then you know the service around that. So it, it's 
basically they're paying we're paying them to manage the citation from the time that it's issued till the time that it's either paid adjudicated or unpaid so it's a model they could have just said instead of paying twenty two thousand dollars a month you're going to pay twenty five thousand dollars a month um, that's just part of the service that's provided and if they sent us a file every month and then we used some other company to print this for us that had the equipment to print and You'd mail have to and pay anyway. package and post we could do that um, but it's just a part of the service that's offered and part of the life cycle of citation management. All right, so I have another question. On the bills list, there was, um, we were paid for accounting principles to break clerk and the explanation was that we were paying someone for parking ticket, mailing, and so on and so forth. Um, hmm? You know what it says there. Anyhow, so I would like that to be, I know we've eliminated a position, this this temp has been working part-time, and so I just would like that to be factored into the budget. So if we're going to see an increase in citations going out and timeliness and so on and so forth, and we have a temporary person from this explanation, looks like processing some of those things, I would like to make sure that we account for that so that when we have our bottom line of revenue, it's accurate. Absolutely. and. Part of the rationale for that was that people continue to move towards paying online, and now that we've, we're removing the dollar barrier fee to paying online, you know, some people would rather save 50 cents and mail it, now they can go online and pay it for free. We, we'll probably see a reduction in the amount of people that mail in, and therefore we'll see less of a need for that temporary person. So I anticipate that by the end of the year we may not need that person anymore. All right, well I would love an update on that. Great. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further lights. All those in favor of passing item A13, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Item A15, your favorite subject, Alderman Rainey. Oh, God. Um, yes. Um, at the June uh, 10, 2019 City Council meeting, Alderman Fisk requested information on the dog beach. Staff has prepared a presentation discussing uh, past revenues, current conditions, and a review of existing city ordinances. Uh, staff is requesting this report be placed on file, and um, Mr. Hemingway is going to give us a report about no dog beach. <laughs> Thank you, Alderman Rainey. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Braithwaite and members of the committee. Lawrence Hemingway, Director of Parks and Recreation and Community, and Community Services. Uh, I'm going to have a brief uh, presentation that will discuss, just give you a brief update on the Dog Beach and where we currently stand, but also uh, colleagues um, Ike Obobo will come before you to talk about the city ordinance from a health perspective, and, um, and Laura Biggs, the Chief of uh, Planning and uh, Capital, will come before you to talk about our next steps and where we're headed as a department or as a city. So what you have up here before you is what the dog beach looked like in 2004. Um, you know, you've heard the story before. Um, you, we've, as a community uh, here right off of Lake Michigan, We've gone through, in the late 90s, uh, record low water levels until the mid-teens uh, when the water began to rise. And probably at the peak, this was the most, uh, this photo here sh I was able to find that showed probably the largest volume of dog beach that we have. Here's your dog beach today, uh, based upon current water levels. It is completely 100% Underwater. Wow. Um, so, Alderman Braithwaite, you want to? There Let's you go. go. Yeah. That's yeah. 04. Right. Um, that's today. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. This Dog Beach entrance. So, part of one of the things we are now uh, really facing and dealing with is um, because of these high water levels, there's a significant amount of erosion that is continuing to uh, impact the lakefront. In this photo here, this, what you see in this photo is the entrance, the double gate is the entrance where we would bring our beachcomber through. The small single gate is the entrance of uh, patrons that will come through the dog, uh, and that will enter into the dog beach uh, along with their pet. 
what you see now, the erosion that has taken place because of these high water levels has made it a safety issue for folks to enter. This picture doesn't show, but that's about a 12 inch drop. What used to be sand is now gone because of the erosion due to the high water levels. And so because of that, there's no short term remediation from a department perspective. So we have, the, the beach has been closed. You know, normally we leave the dog beach open uh, the last two years, even though we wasn't collecting any revenue because there were small swatches of sand. That's no longer an option because of this. Uh, earlier this spring, I showed, I came to you and showed what, how the uh, website in which we use as a department to monitor uh, the water levels. And real quick, if you just follow the, the lines there that's present, I know it's a little small, but that red line is just kind of your average over time. Um, the, the federal government started keeping Lake Michigan water levels all the way back in 1918. And so that's your average in red. The solid blue line kind of is your uh, annual average. It goes up. And then the dotted line is your monthly average. And as you see, um, we are well above our normal average, as you, as you can see here in this photo. <laughs> Revenue. How has the loss of not operating the dog beach hurt us as a department? Um, each year, there's a various amount of passes. As you can see in the early, in the early teens, we was in the high nines, mid nines, up to our highest point of a thousand since we've been collecting. Um, the revenue here in this uh, decade. These are the amount of revenues that we have lost uh, because of not operating the current dog beach. I'm now going to turn this over to um, Mr. Odobo for his part of the presentation to speak to the health issues about one of the questions we were asked is why can't we share a swimming beach uh, and make it part-time a dog beach, so I'll let Mr. Ike talk to you about that. Thank you, Director. Good day, members of the committee. Ike Ogbo, Interim Director, Health and Human Services Department. And I'm here to briefly discuss the state regulations as it pertains to dogs and beaches. Um, actually, the state does not recommend, actually it prohibits dogs being on the same beach as human beings and there are reasons to that there are some health implications to to that regard and of course the health implications are as we perhaps know pets carry diseases not only that the possibility of fleas and waste and not only that the aggressive behaviors that they might exhibit and allergic reactions so the state definitely prohibits having dogs in the same beach as human beings because of these reasons. And in our city code, we are actually compliant. We do have embedded in our code that cats, dogs, or any pets are not actually allowed at our beaches except for a designated dog beach. So we are compliant in that regard, which is good. If we decide in the future that we are going to have a dog beach, which is, which is great, uh, the state doesn't actually govern that. We have to make our own rules and our own regulations on how we are going to govern our dog beaches. And luckily for us, we do have a city ordinance that pertains primarily to dog beaches. And that section is actually listed there. So it has its regulations, it has its rules, it has its do, and do or don'ts. So if we decide in the nearest future that we're going to have a dog beach, we already have this ordinance in place. So, so. Thank you, Director. Seeing no lights. Oh, yep. Thank you. Can you want it? So I was, okay. I was asked to um, sort of come up with a plan. I've been working with Lawrence and the Parks Department to come up with a plan on how we would proceed with designating a dog bark park. And we were focused more on designating separate dog park spaces because 
Um, actually, in general, the same increase in the water level that is removing sections of the, what was a dog beach from availability for dogs is also starting to affect our people beaches. And so uh, we are looking at having less people beach already than we used to have. So uh, we, we talked about how would we go about establishing a separate new dog park there's currently one that is shared with the village of Skokie that is in the southwest corner of the city of Evanston. But how would we make one that was maybe more conveniently located for our residents? And uh, so the process that we looked at is, involves a more methodical process. Not everybody wants to live next to a, a dog park, but some people actually do want to live next to a dog park because they have dogs. So. It turns out this is a question that many communities wrestle with. How do you establish what's a good dog park location? And um, there's a lot of information out there about the rating criteria that different places have used to develop it. And there's also industry standard that have been set up for siting and, and locating and designing dog parks. So we can go through that and uh, review it. We already roughly know what the criteria types are. Things like what's a minimum size area that is appropriate to have dogs in? What is the fencing situation? How far away should it be from residential homes? So that can all be done, but it, um, we would basically identify and evaluate and set criteria for the city of Evanston to establish a, a dog park. And then we could look at our existing parks, other city properties that have vacant space on them, and evaluate those spaces to see what would be appropriate to locate a dog park. I think it's gonna be a question of, uh, it's gonna be challenging to find that really perfect location, so we're going to need to basically come up with comparisons of what are the sites that best fit our situation. And we may need to look at available private property that's on the market as well. Then um, the longest, <laughs> The longest plan phase of any planning is when we really engage the community and discussion and engagement to get feedback. We feel like that'd be a really important part of citing a dog park. Uh, we are looking at, we would do community meetings, surveys, uh, perhaps go through the Parks and Recreation Board, then evaluating the cost. They range quite a bit in uh, amenities that are available depending on where they've been built and then we would come back to the city council with a recommendation. So the timeline that this would take us to do actually extends a, a while. We would probably start this project a little later in the year. Currently it's construction season and also uh, capital planning division's pretty involved in um, developing our budget for next year. And then we would, uh, but we would do the research on developing criteria and then proceed into having that community discussion we would also look at what our funding sources would be and, and schedule funding into the budget and bring a recommendation in about a year back to the city council at how to proceed. Following that, we would engage in design and then in construction. Thank you for your report. So one final comment, Alderman yeah. Braithway, is um, you know, the, I've showed you guys kind of the visual impact um, of, of where we are with the dog park. This Wednesday at 6.30 at the Ecology Center, um, State Rep uh, Robin Gable is hosting a, um, a, a community meeting to discuss um, just the impact of these high water levels uh, that are taking place along, you know, throughout Lake Michigan. Um, I'm, I will be speaking on behalf of the city and I'll be talking about um, the impact toward our beaches. And specifically, earlier this year, you heard uh, Project 1122, which is the sharing of sand from Waukegan Harbor. This uh, is a community meeting focused on that. And then so I'll be outlining the beaches uh, that we uh, determined that we would like to participate that were proposed in that initiative uh, and where they currently stand and why we were trying to be uh, participants in that project. So just wanted to make that announcement. We'll be talking about those beaches uh, 6.30 this Wednesday at the Ecology Center. Thank you, Director. Uh, there were two questions uh, Alderman suffered in, followed by Alderman Rainey. Um, Dr. Hemingway, so the chart you showed with the money that we've gotten and that we're at zero, 
if we were to go forward with a dog park, we would be negative for one or two years probably before. I mean, would we charge? Could we charge comparable rates to what we charge for the dog beach for a dog park if we made it nice enough? Well, how do you anticipate getting a user fee out of? Uh, well, we currently uh, charge at the existing, the shared dog park that we have. So, absolutely, I think if we were able to establish a separate dog park, we would absolutely have a fee. We would govern it, uh, govern uh, the dog park the way we did the dog beach by requiring residents to have up-to-date vaccinations, pay that fee. It would be an annual fee, and we will be able to generate revenue from it. Okay, but it would be a couple of years probably, or – I mean, it's more, yeah. When we did the dog beach, yes. we just put up a gate, right? There wasn't a build out. This would require a build out. Yes, there will be. Oh, it would require okay. to yeah. some form. Yeah. Just depends on the location that's selected. Sure. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alderman Rainey. I was going to ask about the shared dog park. How? How? Um, what kind of participation is there? Oh. Um, Father and Rainey, right. I, I can just, I, want, I don't want to guess. Let me look it up. I mean, we do have, uh, you know, my, my let, let me look it up and I'll give you the answer here shortly. But it it's a pretty long. big space, right? Oh, it's yeah. a, you're talking about acres wise? Right. Yeah, it, it, it's over an acre large. I mean, it's a, it has, it's a very large space, uh, along the shoreline of the, of, uh, the, the canal. The canal. Mm -hmm. Um, but it has an open space. Most dog parks, a lot, well, I'm sorry, a lot of dog parks have a large dog space and then a small dog space. The one that we share with Skokie does, Pooch Park, has a large dog space where large dogs can open and run. And then they have two smaller spaces that are gated off for smaller dogs so they don't have to interact with the large dogs, et cetera. So an ideal dog park would include some form of large dog, small dog space. I mean, I've never gotten any complaints from anybody from that, so it seems to be working. And there's a lot of other space over there, up and down the canal. So, I mean, what is wrong with looking into more space there? Um, we, we, there's nothing wrong with that. I think... Um, the only cost to that is maintenance, right? Maintaining it. We have to well, we there, share the cost of maintaining We currently, yeah, the, the cost is, Skokie maintains it, so let, we, let's be we, clear. Right, but we pay for half the cost of maintenance. Well, yeah, the revenue that, that you got it, that's correct. So, um, but along looking at other space, I mean, I think you have to look at the parks along the canal and how they're currently used and right. programmed. Yeah. And so, yeah. As Laura alluded to, that's part of the plan for uh, we work closely together and plan to go out in the community to, to, to try to make that decision. Just as a point of information, I'm going to be mindful of the time. And we started this at our at the Animal Welfare Committee by looking at the parks that have an F. So we looked at the parks that had a failing grade where there are no kids apparatuses to target a few just to get the conversation started. and. I'm looking at all of them in Fisk. Maybe that's something that you can pick up because you can't just put a dog park anywhere, obviously, where you have kids, playground equipment, busy streets, et cetera. So it'll be interesting to see where this conversation goes. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. It's been moved in a second just to keep this on file. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, the motion carries. We still have one, two, three, four, quite a few items here. A16, Sheridan Square Parking Update, Alderman Sufferton. Sure. Uh, item A16, after discussion at the June 24th, 2019 Transportation and Parking Committee, staff removed signs restricting parking for 22 spaces on the east side of Sheridan Square, 24 hours a day, except those with the District R permit. The entire length of Sheridan Square, both sides, is now designated as residence parking only from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m., which is also reflected in the city code. Staff requests the report be placed on file and seeks direction on next steps. Uh, and I've got a couple questions. Seconds. Uh, if I, is it you? Uh, sure. Just, how did this happen? It was a 22 space private parking lot from November 30th, 2015 until last Tuesday. It was, it should have sunset. It was affirmatively rejected by this committee. How, how do we get to a place where there's 22 parking spaces that are unlawfully restricted, and did we write any tickets to anybody? 
So we did uh, write some tickets for sp parking in that spaces. We ran a report. Uh, we've looked through it. There's approximately 75 tickets that were issued during that time period, um, half of which have been paid. Um, the short answer to how did this happen is uh, we don't bat a thousand. The uh, direction came from the committee and the parking division manager at the time did not communicate it to his staff and therefore the signs were not removed. So that happened and it's regrettable and uh, the signs were in place and so people were parking in a place where it was signed that they shouldn't be parking. Um, so we have been taking quite a few measures since we've gotten a new interim parking manager to go through uh, what I call the, the trifecta, the triangle, the golden triangle, which is do the signs match the code and does the code match this online map that we're creating for residents to use. So we've got an intern on board who's spending copious amount of her time block by block, street by street, making sure that the signs in the neighborhood reflect what's actually in the code and that the code reflects what's on the map. So this is a long process. We're aware that the street signs don't always match the code. Uh, there's been, you know, the city's been in existence for 100 years. Signs get lost, signs get stolen. We don't always know about that. And so we're not able to go out and replace those signs. And so it takes instances like this for things to be brought to light and, and then we make the requisite fixes. So how long do you think before we can say that we've had somebody look at all the signs and match them up to the code? I would say that we would, this is a project we're looking at for six months. Okay. We want to be thorough, we want to be complete, and then we'll be coming back to the council with code modifications if there's any areas where there's incompatible uh, code versus street. I'm, I can't speak to the last 20 years and how, uh, how well people were doing at making sure that uh, ordinances once codified were properly signed. Okay. We've got a street sign inventory that, that was done a few years ago, but uh, we, it'll never be perfect because signs do go missing, get defaced, get hit, you know, things like that. But we're, you know, always striving to make sure that what's on the street accurately reflects what's in the code. Um, but we, we were made aware a couple of years ago about residential parking districts. Certain areas people would go and try to buy the sticker uh, for their residential district and it wasn't, they didn't live in the block or they didn't live, the code didn't reflect what actually was on the street. Uh, but because they had been buying the sticker for so many years, they they felt like they should still get continue to get that. So that's an issue that we're working through ward by ward with aldermen and the constituents. Um, so that's also part of that uh, citywide okay. parking. So if we were to have a comprehensive parking study, is this something that would be included in that? I'm happy to report that we are making really good progress on an RFP for the citywide parking study and we hope to have it out in the next 30 days. Okay. Does it include some sort of proofreading of all these signs? It includes a recommendation on uh, existing parking restrictions in the neighborhood. Um, we can add in there that there's also an audit done on just to double check our work as far as what staff done to make sure the code properly reflects what's on the street. Okay. And that could be also part of up updating the street sign inventory in future years. All right. Thank you. Thank you Alderman Fleming, and did Alderman Randy, did I see your light? No. Thank you, Alderman Fleming. So for the 75 tickets that we've issued, what is our plan? So some haven't been paid, so I assume that we're going to void, void those so they don't have a late charge for a ticket they should not have gotten. Amnesty. Well, I, yeah, whatever we want to call it, right? People have gotten a ticket for a law that didn't break. So and then what is our plan for the people who have paid a ticket for a code that, or some signs that should have been down and a code that should have been changed? So that is, that's part of the discussion that we're having tonight. Like I said, we do have 75 tickets, half of which were paid, um, but there was a, a sign depicting a regulation, even though it would, didn't match what was on the code. So somebody did read a sign and decide not to follow the rules. Now, we, we all know that that was not proper because it didn't actually reflect what was in the code, um, but this isn't the only time that this has happened citywide where street signs were not correct. So if the council's direction is uh, for me to do something with those tickets that were paid or unpaid, I'm happy to do that to the best of my ability. I have information that I can do that with. Um, so that is my direction. I think the people who have not paid the ticket, we should 
void the ticket. They should not have any kind of penalty or late charge, and the people who have paid the ticket should get their money back because they paid a ticket for an error that was ours. If there's consensus on the committee, we'll proceed with that direction. Second. All right, so I guess we'll just cheat as a friendly direction. All those in favor of directing staff to void ticketed and then not charge for the ones that have been, you know what I mean. So a refund and a void. Second. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Aye. If you have the consensus. Thank you. All right. So you'll have a few more items to get through. A17. Alden Simmons, please. A17. At the request of City Council, staff has examined the cost and scope of work required to install additional street sweeping signs at mid block locations throughout the city. Staff requests this report be placed on file and seeks direction and next steps. It's for it um, to be accepted and placed on file. Thank you, Alden Simmons. All second. those in favor? Pause, oh, making a second. Yep, it's been probably moved and seconded. All those in favor, please. Sit. I, my lights are. Oh, I'm sorry, my paper. Alden Rainey. Well, I couldn't agree more that our signage is inadequate in terms of the size and, you know, one sign is at one end of the block and one is at the other end of the block. However, um, in my ward, we have taken it upon ourselves in certain neighborhoods where there is, at least at the beginning of the season, there really is inadequate compliance. And what we did in zone four, and I've offered it in other zones in the ward, is we typed up, we are pretending like we're in Chicago, we typed up a very simple bright orange flyer that says on the first, on, on Tuesday, don't park here, on Wednesday, don't park here. And on the weekend before the fourth, Tuesday and Wednesday, we tie four or five of these flyers on trees on that, the proper side of the street. And I am telling you, for probably 10 cents a month, we get total compliance. It's an amazing thing. And it takes, it takes five minutes a person to do one side of the street. It does. Imagine that. Imagine that. And it, it, it really works. Occasionally we have somebody who, you know, doesn't see it. But I think if you ask the streets department, when they come into the 8th Ward and they see those orange signs on trees, there is not a car 99% of the time on, on the street. It really works. I don't know where they put their cars, but the, the orange signs just signal, I got to get my car out of here. And you know, I, I don't know what this is going to cost, but I just think if we could get, you know, people on the block to do this. And I had like 300 of these Xerox at the beginning of the year. And I just handed them out to people who volunteered. Sure. It just takes five minutes. Thank you, Alden Rainey. Uh, seeing no additional lights, all those in favor of accepting this putting on file, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All right, motion carries. Item A21 is resolution 71-R-19, authorizing the city manager to sign a memorandum of understanding with Northwestern University for the operations of the beach at Lincolnwood and Campus Drive. It's for action. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Uh, Alderman Fleming. Sorry, I, I, I have a few questions, and I guess they're not questions. I, I have some concerns, so I have... Um, so concerned about the parking um, that during the week when people go to the beach at you know noon or whatever, uh, the parking is eight dollars. I understand they have options to go to a different beach, but you know if that's the one that they want to go to, it's eight dollars, and people might not be aware of that once they get over there. Um, my other concern was I'm sorry I had it highlighted here. Um, so there's a couple of things in here where it says, so they can change the rates of the parking after 30 days, they can do something else in 30 days, which is not coming to me. So I, I guess overall what I'm saying is, when we went to, 
IDNR, you know, I think their direction was that this was not our beach or Northwestern's beach, it was their beach. And, and now we've come to this memorandum to let Northwestern and ourselves use it. Um, but it's just not as usable as the other beaches. Now, granted, it's not the beach that I would go to because it's not closest to my house and, you know, there's construction and everything else. But for people who this is their closest beach, it, it just doesn't come off as welcoming as our other beaches do. Um, and I'm sure Northwestern is aware of this. I, I drove my, rode my bike over there the other day just as a bike ride, and it has some issues now with flooding, which I'm sure you guys are aware of and going to work on because you can't even access the beach now based on you know, how you come into the beach, kind of a ramp is off, it flooded out, and granted, we've had a lot of bad weather, but I, I assume that that's something that during high beach season, which is right now, the Northwestern would make sure, to the best of their ability, that that's taken care of so that our residents can actually access the beach if they would so choose. So um, I have mixed feelings about this. I appreciate that um, the beach is going to be available, but it's also just not as available and welcoming as I would love it to be. Thank you, Alderman Fleming. Seeing no further lights, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. That's not an option. Do we need to do a roll call? Um, I'm going to vote it through to council, but I, I so still have some, council, yeah. have some concerns. So we have some concerns that we want. Okay. So it's been, there's enough to move this to council, and then we'll address it then. Um, so that's a... Uh, yeah. All right. Last item, Alderman Fleming, item A222. 22 is resolution 75 R19, accepting a grant from Illinois Housing Development Authority's abandoned residential property municipal relief program. This is a um, council's recommending, sorry, staff's recommending we adopt this resolution that will provide $75,000 in funding to address property issues. Um, at registered vacant properties, funds will be provided through an account approved by IHDA for action. Second. Properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 See, all right. Ayes have it. Uh, we have one item for discussion, APW1, Robert Crown Local Employment Program and W, excuse me, MWEB program status update. Oh, oh, gosh, we got to go back to those. All right, thank you. So first, we're going to suspend the rules for item A23, A24, A25, A26, and A27, all that were read uh, in the beginning of the meeting for action and introduction. Uh, I object to A25. Okay, we're going to pull A25 off. Is there anyone else? All right. Uh, is there a motion to suspend the rules? Move. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. So now there's a motion on the floor to move for introduction and action item A23, A24, A26, and A27. Is there a second? Second. It's been properly moved and seconded to introduce the following items for introduction and action. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Item A25 is ordinance 67-0-19 amending the city code section 10-11-18 uh, to add Lincoln Street parking pilot program. That's for introduction. Uh, yeah. I I just it's one who's asking I'm for it. Second. I, okay, it's been moved and seconded. All them suffered in. Is there anybody asking for it besides the residents of that block? Who gets that? Oh, uh, Mr. Mayor. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, who's asking for this uh, pilot program? On the 1600 block of Lincoln Avenue. Yeah. Uh, that's been endorsed by the aldermen as well as uh, neighbors from the community. Okay, because I, it's an undue burden on six ward residents. Uh, who live far from the train. Uh, and I think the Sheridan Square situation demonstrates we don't have the credibility to do a pilot program. I mean, I, not you personally, but the city of Evanston. I, I, uh, I understand you. Uh, so I'm just going to encourage everyone to vote no. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, seeing no lights, all those in favor of passing, and this is for introduction, item A25, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? No. no. 
Okay, I'll count myself as an I. That we'll move it along to uh, to council. All right, we have one more item for discussion, and that's uh, APW one. Who's here to speak to this? So it's like Robert Crown Local Employment Program and EB program status and update. Gentlemen, welcome. Do you mind, Laura, you want to introduce the guests? Thank you. Um, Aldermen, members of the committee, my name is Laura Biggs. I'm the city engineer and Bureau Chief of Capital Planning. We're here tonight to give a brief update on the status of the compliance of Bullion Andrews with the city's MWEBE program as well as their compliance with the local employment program. I have with me Joel Klein and Lee. I'm so sorry, Lee Fantros um, from Bullion Andrews and Bullion Construction to, or Bullion Andrews and Boa, Boa Construction, thank you, uh, to do the update. Good evening, Chairman and committee members. Um, Joel Klein, Bullion Andrews, Lee Fantroy, Boa Construction. So, first we're going to just touch on what our approach has been. So, for the local employment uh, program approach, uh, during our presentation, uh, during the selection process, we committed to doing at least four steps in this regard. One was to engage local union business agents to ID residents that are res that are residing. <coughs> pardon me, I'm suffering from a summer cold. Um, engage local union business agents to identify residents for outreach during the course of uh, the pre-construction phase. Uh, leverage the City of Evanston local employment database for potential uh, trade workers on the project. Uh, hold an open call meeting to introduce project to Evanston trade workers to align opportunities with potential bidding firms. And then uh, finally uh, com complete and include subcontract language in our subcontract agreements to stipulate compliance. Uh, for the minority women in Evanston Business Enterprise approach, we have four steps that we've followed. Uh, open call meetings to introduce project, the project to Evanston vendors. Uh, we encourage um, both in that process and through our outreach during pre-construction, uh, sub-tier contracting with MW and EBE firms. Uh, solicit bids from qualified MWEBE contractors, vendors for subcontract work, and then share construction management work with our partner um, MWEBE, I'm sorry, our MBE partner BOA uh, on the construction management side of the project. The project goals and the actuals to date um, for the requirements. 15% of on-site labor hours to be completed by Evanston residents. Um, MBW, sorry, M Minority Women Evanston Business Enterprises, uh, a combined total of 25% uh, participation for on-site work. Um, the current actuals as of the end of June, we are at 6% for local on-site worker participation hours. Um, that's based on uh, seven individuals who are residents working on the project in various capacities over the course of the last uh, nine months. And then we're at 20.9% for um, minority women in Evanston-based business participation. Wanted to emphasize in the context of that calculation the content that uh, Bo is providing with project engineering, submittal management, subcontractor management, and on-site observations with superintendents. One of the things that we've learned over the course of the project to date um, is that we have some unanticipated challenges to meeting compliance. Um, as I mentioned during the uh, LEP approach, we reached out to local union res representatives to establish a pool from which we could um, endeavor to get them engaged under the project. Uh, we found out over the course of the time of our pre-construction and construction phase that of 
13 different unions that we've reached out to. Seven unions have no workers that reside in Evanston. Uh, that's the cement masons, iron workers, pipe fitters, sheet metal workers, sprinkler fitters, terrazzo workers, and glazers. Two of the 10 unions report they have only one worker residing in Evanston. Uh, that was the brick masons and the plumbers. And one union reports five workers are residing in Evanston, and all uh, that's the uh, local union, uh, electrical union 134. Um, all of those workers are working. Um, that is, so that represents one of the challenges that we have in hitting that 15 percent, and that drives um, our um, discovery of a more limited labor pool than we understood there to be uh, for Evanston residents. From an MBE, Minority Women Evanston-based business enterprise, the union requirements are such that um, there are very few, uh, if in fact in some cases there are no businesses in Evanston that provide some of the trade contract work we need. And what we found is that in instances where we're not able to contract directly with a minority women or Evanston-based business, that the sub-tier cost in some cases uh, price that trade at a higher premium. So we do have some information in terms of the detail of, of the totality of Evanston-based businesses that we are working with. Um, there are five firms that are Evanston-based businesses that we have found through the vendor fair process or through uh, working with Sharon Johnson in her office and capacity. Um, We've got 10 women business enterprises that we're subcontracting directly with and nine minority firms. The next steps um, are to engage, I believe it's next week, we're attending the uh, MWEVE committee to review these same efforts in greater detail and discuss fresh ideas. Um, some of these have been discussed informally with members of uh, Sharon Johnson and Kevin uh, Brown's uh, group um, looking at hiring Evanston youth for construction related internship opportunities, um, opportunities in our various offices and subcontractors offices to expose Evanston residents to non-trade related uh, roles in construction on and off the job site, project engineering, project management, estimating, things of that nature. Uh, hire Evanston residents for non-trade related roles off the job site. Uh, hire Evanston residents for trade related roles on BNA and BOA projects. Um, to date, we've hired, um, I believe, two people at Bully and Andrews to work in trade capacities, but not on the Robert Brown project. Um, we continue with our efforts on almost a daily basis to query about available staff that are trade union trade workers that have come available. Um, and try to align them with trade contractors that are mobilizing or have mobilized. See a couple of lights, Alderman Rainey, followed by Alderman Simmons. Hi, thanks for your report. How many, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to ask you something that you've already answered, but I might have missed it. How many adult Evanstonians are currently working at the Robert Crown Project? We've had, to date, we've had seven um, Evanstonians, as you say, working on the project. Currently, as of today, I think we're at three or four. Some of the things, nuances to the process is, for instance, some of the site utility work up front had several trade workers. That work is now no longer taking place. That'll start back up when some of the um, issues get addressed. So at any one time, it could be as many as seven, but right now I would say we're probably three or four. Have you had people um, inquire that you felt were not adequately prepared to do the work that you weren't able to take on? We, at, at our outreach meeting, we had a lot of interest, but all of those folks were um, not currently members of union affiliations. Um, we have offered to sponsor our subcontractor, uh, electrical subcontractor offered to sponsor people into the electrical union, 134, which has jurisdiction here in Evanston. Uh, we've offered to sponsor carpenters and laborers. Um, there is a good pool of union laborers and carpenters that are represented on the local employment list. Um, as of 
as recently as a week ago when I looked at the employment list, um, there are 28 individuals listed, 18 of those are laborers, five are carpenters, uh, two are out of the area, uh, electricians, local 701 and local 9, which they would have to clear in through 134 to be eligible, uh, one plumber who's a fourth year apprentice, and then one non-union carpenter makes up that 28. Um, some modest signs of success is the uh, one um, available electrician. We have tracked him down to uh, another firm and we have uh, our electrical subcontractor has made arrangements for when they start work on the interior fit out for him to join the project. Um, the same has happened with the fourth year apprentice plumber. Um, our plumbing subcontractor has committed to, they've identified the individual, they've spoken to the individual and talked to the union hall. So when they start their interior work, which is the majority of their work, he will be joining the project as well. Thank you. Any women on the job ever? Um, there are. Yeah. Um, we Evanston are, women? Yeah. What's that? Evanston women? Uh, we've actually um, employed, um, ev our excavation contractor employed, I believe, two uh, women Evanston residents as laborers. Um, that since their work has slowed down, Bullion Andrews is considering um, one of them that who is not currently working on the project to work on other Bullion Andrews projects. We ask her to go to the, they have to do a fit test relative to some of the requirements relative to respirators and things. So we have her doing that. So we're optimistic that that'll work out since she was already a member of the project. Thank you. Thank you. Alden Simmons. Um, acknowledging this update. Um, in addition to this, I asked that you provide a um, projected report on how you're going to get to the minimum 15%. So I continue to hear that when you get into the finishes that you should get your numbers up in compliance. And for any sort of confidence going forward, I would need um, the finishes, the line items already have values and you, I'm, I imagine you have identified the local um, workforce and you should be able to say at this point we should get to 15%. So I need a guarantee to 15% minimum. I was really hopeful in supporting this project that we would um, exceed our goals for LEP as well as MWEBE, and we're in single digits is not okay. Last I checked, we had spent $17 million. Um, where are we at now on dollars spent on this project? Yeah, um, I believe through June it's $20 million. So we spent $20 million and 6% has gone to our local workforce. Mm -hmm. Yep. 20% has gone to women, a minority, and Evanston Business Enterprises. Correct. When you took this project, you were aware of our goals and also our ordinances. And it's my opinion that you should have vetted our workforce and your scope to make sure that you can comply with our goals. I'm not okay with us spending the amount of money that we're spending and our local workforce is not working. I'm not okay that our local contractors are not participating in a more substantial manner. I understand that there is um, a goal to possibly have a hiring fair where uh, there's some support staff working in the trailers that is not going to get us to the numbers of compliance based on the lower wage that those employees will earn. With that said, I cannot support, and I don't know how I make this ask, but until we have a proposal or a, a, a report that shows a path forward to a minimum 15%, I don't want any more work done at Robert Crown. That's my ask. 6% is way too low. I don't know where we are legally, what that means, but I ask specifically for a path forward to 15% and I don't have it. So if you're able to communicate that to me, 
and give me some confidence, then I would love to support this. I would love for it to be on time and the community enjoy the wonderful amenities of Robert Crown. But based on our responsibility as committee people on MWEBE, this is not something that I can support. Understood. Can you give me a path forward to 15%? As I reported in January when we met last at the MWEBE committee, I cannot. Part of the problem is the workforce doesn't exist in Evanston in a union, on a union project. There are seven unions that have zero uh, residents. So that is the cement masons, the iron workers, the pipe fitters, the sheet metal workers, sprinkler fitters, terrazzo workers, and glazers. In total, that could be as much as 40 or 50 percent of the project. We could not investigate that prior to proposing because the unions will not talk to us until we've awarded to a union contractor. And in fact, and in fact a number of these unions won't talk to us directly and we have to work through our subcontractors. It's one of their work rules. So, so we're working within the context of the rules of the game that we have to play by. Can you go back to the last slide? So here are my suggestions just to, okay. to help you get there because I, I understand two things is if there are a lot of projects going on and the good thing is people are working. So that's, that's a good thing. And, and the program is working in that sense that two, three years ago we had a room of 34 laborers looking and now they're all employed. But where I would where be supported, so we could, we could run a report from, from Sharon to get that, that list in terms of who, who's employed. But if I could finish my thought, so I'm looking at where you said hire youth for construction related internships. I think at this point, of the game we which was explained by NOS and also our staff is once the building is buttoned up that's when there are going to be opportunities and I would think at this point of the game you would have a job description for all those internship opportunities I mean what do they look like how many will be employed as well as I'll say it again a job description um, NOSA made this point months ago at our meeting residents for non-trade related roles on the job site what are those positions? How many? What are the qualifications? Because in the absence of that information, it's just, you know, empty words to Alderman Simmons' point. Uh, higher residents for non-trade related, again, off-site. What are those positions? What are the salaries? How many folks are going to be? I mean, the goal of our committee and the effort is not to find businesses and inflate the price. We just talked about that. It's literally to put residents to work. And so the last one, again, this is your, what you wrote, High Evanston Residents, Trade Related Roles, other BA BOA projects. What are those projects? We're, um, we're doing that. Okay. I mean, that's actually, actually being done. John Treats is a carpenter foreman. He's working yeah. for us on a project. Um, we've got, um, I mentioned uh, another woman that we're talking to as a, a labor, woman labor work on other Bullion Andrews projects. Um, we've got Mark Thomas, who's working for us as a laborer and has since the beginning of the project. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're, we're I, I, I cannot stand here and say, um, truthfully, that we're going to get to 15%. We're not giving up on it, but there also isn't a path there when we don't have any sheet metal workers, we don't have any pipe fitters, we had no iron workers that were local residents. That reduces the available pool from which we can Right. try to find. So it's clear what you can't do. I'm trying to emphasize what you can do based on right. what you wrote on there. And the request is to really quickly come back with a list of positions. I mean, NOSA made this, he presented this to our committee months ago. And so to sit here in the month of July when it's scheduled to wrap up in December and not have positions that are detailed salaries, wages that accompany those positions is, is very concerning. And I would hope that that's something that you all can come back with extremely quickly. Point taken. Thank you. I see Laura moving towards the podium. I don't know if you wanted to, to say something. Yes, this is, um, this was uh, determined to be put onto this committee sort of last minute during a holiday week. And it was our intention to come to the MWEVE committee with a more interactive discussion later this month sure. and be able to flesh out more of these details as well as have 
more of a discussion format where we work towards problem solving. All right. Well, thank you for those comments. I think it should be clear. Obviously, you, you see the intentions of this committee where the focus needs to be. Um, so our next committee is are we meeting July? Wednesday. That's like almost a week from now. Yeah, yeah. we are meeting. Okay. Um, but you don't see a path to 15. I'm, I'm just stuck there. I'm, I'm, I'm stuck. So city manager Storley, thank you. Mike, can you please take your, your seat? Thank you. Uh, good evening, members of committee. I uh, wanted to just make a correction. The project isn't complete in December. The project is complete next July. So after okay. the building is constructed, there's uh, the, con the contractor has already identified an MWEPE uh, person to do the, the deconstruction of the existing center. Got it. Uh, and then there's going to be additional opportunities as we do the field reconstruction and things like that. So um, I totally empathize. Yeah. And, and the goal of 15% is something that we would strive for. Absolutely. I, I understand the, the bar barriers that are in place to them getting there. Uh, simply, the people do not exist. And if they were, if they did, they'd be hiring them. So I, we're all committed to helping them yeah. place them on other projects, do other things, do the training, things like that. I think that they you know, have a little bit more lead time now to get to, to the MW committee later in the month and they can provide additional information uh, during that time period. Um, but at this point, uh, there's limited options to get to the 15% and that presents a challenge for all of us. And that's not because people in this town are sitting at home not working with the union card. It's that there's nobody in this town with the union card right now that's not employed on another job site or employed with this project. So that is the challenges that we're facing as we move forward with this project. Is there any way to do some workforce development parallel or with this incorporated into this project to at least train the workforce so that they're qualified? I mean, it and that's a very exciting component of all of this is that uh, Bullying Anders is willing to, like I said, to sponsor people who would be interested in obtaining that union card. They had uh, sponsorships through the electrical union to train people or to sponsor people to get into the union, which are excellent paying jobs with great future opportunities. Um, but there are, was, has not yet been people interested in going down that pathway with them. What kind of outreach has been done? So that is another thing that we can continue to work on. Yeah. Uh, there has been outreach, but we can always do better on outreach, and I think that that will also be uh, one of the things that they will expand upon when we have time to come back with more information to MWB committee. Well, I mean, I think outreach is key. There's a, a workforce here that is thirsty for this sort of living wage job. Um, excuse me? I'm just waiting to have my turn. Oh. The additional <laughs> challenge to that is that the unemployment in Evanston right now is historically low. Mm -hmm. And so while there may be people who are underemployed who would take it a management opportunity to be sponsored, they're employed doing something else at a lower wage. So they can't take time away from that existing job to come and train on this job. So that, that's a, just a, for, for comp color in the, the whole picture, uh, that's another challenge that we're facing. Alderman Rainey. I, I think it's important that we all have our own opinions on this, but I think I think to blame Bully Andrews for for not having the employees that we want him or them to have is maybe not the way to be going. One of the good news, one of the, some good news here is that there aren't people over there banging on the door for jobs because maybe there aren't the unemployed in this town as we've been reading about, we have a low level of unemployment. Now, maybe those are people that we read about that have fallen out of the workforce, but that might not be the case. Also, how many programs do we have, including the mayor's program and other programs that have to do with workforce development. We are, we are in the beginning stages of developing people to be in the workforce. And maybe people that we're working with now just aren't quite ready to be at that high level to go into um, a training program for a union card. That doesn't mean that we aren't working on it. And I think to shut down a project like this because we're upset that they're not, they're not there. 
what about what about our WEBE program? Are we are we filtering people into Bully Andrews? What are we doing there? What about the lists we have? I talked to the woman who runs that program, and I mean, where where is that list? What's going on with those people on the list? I expect the people on the WEBE committee to know exactly who's on the list and who's being sent over to the programs. Remember, a couple of weeks ago, we issued the a four-month contract to our to our handyman program guy. Four-month program for twenty thousand dollars. We put we put out we sent to twenty people, twenty minority contractors, asking them to please apply for this twenty thousand dollars. We did not get one response to 20 Evanston, Evanston workers who were perfectly qualified to get $20,000. Not one responded. You can't make people respond. You can't make people apply. So I, I really, I, you know, I, I'm not sure we should be beating up bully Andrews in this, although I, I, I think given this community, there should be more people going there. I just think we ought to stop, step back, and take a look and see why he's not getting more applicants. So, and I, I really agree. do. So I'm, I'm, not, really I'm do. not beating up. I know I'm not saying you are, I'm, but I'm saying I don't, bad choice of words, I'm not sure it's his fault. So, and I hear you, but I think that this discussion has to be had publicly so that everyone that has a role can be accountable, whether it's workforce development or outreach, what sort of effort has been made to get the information out there. And yes, our unemployment numbers are, are, are better, but there are certain communities where the unemployment number, you know, is, is not. So I'm just trying to push everyone here for us to do better. I mean, we have a real opportunity to get folks working. We're spending so much money. I'm not okay with saying, oh, you know, a waiver, oh, it's fine. We tried and we couldn't. Okay, so I, it's so, I wasn't quite finished. Let's so all a, I'm saying is that. Let's have a suggestion. Of that. Let's have a meeting of this committee in the next time, ne the next Monday, we don't have an Administration Public Works Committee. And let's put out the word, we're going to have a meeting. Everybody who would be interested in working on the Robert Crown project, come to the meeting, and we will sit here and have a, a community conversation about how you can get a job on this project. And that's fine. I think we should do that. I agree. We should, I do, it. We should do it. But I also think that when we work with um, contractors and we are investing in their business and they are providing a service for us, they should understand the values of our city. And so it shouldn't be a very relaxed, you know, I don't know. I, I don't see a path to 15%. I can't tell you how we're going to get there. How we're going to get there is we're going to work together to get there or else we, we're not, this is, this is not okay. It's not okay. I don't imagine any one of my colleagues is okay with us wrapping up over a $50 million project at 6%. It's shameful. But we're so, paying somebody to funnel people to him. What, are, what is, what's wrong with this project? What's wrong um, with our program? I, I see Alderman Fleming's light. I just had a quick question to our, yeah. Our, um, yeah. When you, so these um, opportunities that you're willing to sponsor people for the apprenticeship, I don't know the details, but it, so we all have award meetings or newsletters or whatever. It would be great if there was a write-up about that, right? I have a award meeting next week. I'm happy to put that out. I'm happy to get that to different houses of worship, you know, wherever in my community, for people who maybe just aren't aware. So if, if they know what the details are, how to apply, how much it pays, whatever the details are, I mean, a job description, it would be great if you could get that to each of us. I know you're talking about doing outreach um, so that we can make sure people in the community do know. Obviously, as Alma Rainey said, we can't make them apply, but they just might not I mean, I've never heard, I've, I heard of it and speak it to you casually, but I don't know the details of it, so I can't even share this is an apprenticeship opportunity and, and this is what it'll pay you or these are the requirements. So if there is something that talks about these opportunities where you're, you're willing to sponsor people, if you could provide that to us or to me, I would be happy to get that out to my community and encourage people to apply if it fits, you know, in their financial needs. 
Yeah, we, we can absolutely do that. We're happy to get that information out through that additional channel. Uh, having worked with Bully and Andrews for the past year and a half, we talk about this every single week. This is not something that we don't take absolutely seriously. And if we saw a path to 15%, we would absolutely be all over it. I'm, I'm just trying to paint the full picture of the challenges that we're encountering so that, like Alderman Rainey said, we can figure out solutions so that in future projects we can get to 15%. But right now, the challenge exists. It's there. We don't see a path. And so that's why we're trying to come here today, be full disclosure, transparent, tell you what barriers are in place to us getting there and not there is no attitude anywhere on this project that we are not committed to this it is just uh, the, the environment that we are currently in today that has barriers to us getting there the reason that bullying Andrews was selected for this project was because they understood the values of this community and they wanted to meet those goals and every single week that goes on in this project they don't take it lightly I can tell you that so Erica to move us forward and I know that we're going to cover this again I, I want to do a couple of things by time you come back to our MWB first we're going to fact check fact check so let's get from Sharon exactly an updated account of everyone that is on our LEP union card carrying to know who's employed and who is an employee that's eligible to work that's number one okay. the second thing just as a point of information you mentioned that the timeline for this project has extended so I can only speak for myself I was thinking December, everything was supposed to be buttoned up. You share that there's a longer timeline. I think it would be important to understand what that timeline is. And then the last thing, and we discussed this in our committee, the, the larger amount includes materials and a whole lot of expenses. We're very focused to members of the community on the labor piece. So I want to, and I'm sure members of the committee, understand what is that labor amount and how many hours are we talking about so if you just you shot yourself in the foot you said you can't get there and I would bet you uh, everything I have in the bank plus a million dollars that you don't know how many hours you're talking about so if we don't know exactly what those labor hours hours are that they've calculated for this project and exactly what that shortfall is I mean that's when all of us here are ready to roll up our sleeves to figure it out starting with the committee taking the lead so I definitely want to know that information um, and then the last thing I'm going to keep coming back to is you put this in writing. It's now part of a public record. We want to see the job descriptions. Period. Like, don't even bother coming to the committee meeting if you don't have a list of job descriptions for all of those uh, bullet points that you put, right? Is, does that sound fair? Yep, absolutely. Perfect. As well as the values for each of the finished line items that you believe we do have the workforce that's going to help with you with the compliance. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, seeing no further lights, um, it is 8.15. Uh, there were a lot of items on this uh, agenda this evening. For those of you that are here for plan development we're going to start that meeting promptly at 8 30. for those of you that are here for city council uh, i don't know if i can i think we i don't know if we can can we start it in five minutes i'm asking corporate council right now yeah we'll start in five minutes I don't see really okay like perfect so if there's a motion adjourned we'll start the Planning and Development Committee meeting at 8.20. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. The meeting is adjourned.